Uh, good evening. I'd like to call this Planning Commission meeting for March 26, 2024 to order. Uh, this is a regular planning meeting and uh, let's see, the Planning Commission is holding hybrid meetings. Members of the public can attend the meeting in person or observe the meeting on Zoom online by visiting cityofarcada.org and following the live meetings link at the bottom of the city's homepage or the city's YouTube channel. If you are attending remotely, please be aware that the Zoom feed provides the closest to real-time stream. If you rely on other feeds and you wish to make comments, please be aware of a time lag on those feeds. And now we move on to the land acknowledgement. The city of Arcata acknowledges that the lands we are located on are unceded ancestral lands of the Wiat tribe. The land that Arcata rests on is known in the Wiat language as Gudini, meaning over in the woods or among the redwoods. Past actions by local, state, and federal governments removed the Wiat and other indigenous peoples from the land and threatened to destroy their cultural practices. The city of Arcata acknowledges the Wiat community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement seeks to aid in dismantling the legacy narratives of settler colonialism. And before we call roll tonight, we have a commissioner joining via Zoom. Uh, the current state law, which was recently passed, Assembly Bill 2449, allows a commissioner to attend remotely under the following circumstances, and there's four bullet points. At least a quorum of the legislative body needs to be in person. The member notifies the city of their need to participate remotely for what is called just cause. Just cause under the law is defined narrowly. Contagious illness, caregiving for a family member, travel for official city business are the most commonly accepted reasons. The commissioner must state the just cause they are citing for remote participation and the commissioner must identify anyone 18 years of age or older in the room with them and their relationship to the commissioner. Commissioner Lehman, can you please confirm for the record that you are attending remotely due to illness and disclose persons present that are over the age of 18? Uh, thank you, Dan. Yes, I am. Uh, attending remotely because of illness and there is no one with me in this room. Thank you. Um, with that, staff, can we please do a roll call? Absolutely. Commissioner Mayer? Here for the last time. Commissioner Yodowitz? Present. Vice Chair Tangney? Uh, present. Commissioner Simmons? Here. And Commissioner Lehman via Zoom? Here. And absent is uh, Commissioner Strickland and Chair Davies. Thank you. Uh, we are joined today by Community Development Director David Loya, Deputy Director Jennifer Dart, and city engineer, Natra Katri. <laughs> All right, now we'll move on to oral communications. During this time, people may make comments about items that are not on the agenda. If you wish to speak on one of our agenda items, you will have an opportunity when we are discussing those items. If you have comments about items that are not listed on today's agenda, please line up now behind the lectern. If you are on Zoom and you wish to make comments on matters that are not on today's agenda, please raise your hand by selecting the raise hand icon on the right side of your screen or by pressing star nine on your phone. The clerk will unmute you when it's your turn to speak. Uh, with that, I'd like to open public comment. Each speaker will have three minutes to comment during oral, oral communications. Feel free to state your name for the record. May we have the first speaker, please. Good evening, Gregory Daggett. I'd like to start the evening out by really thanking Judith for all of her service. I have no idea how many years she's actually been on the planning commission, but for to have somebody that has the education that she has and just I've seen in the years that I've been here, just about the amount of work that she puts in um, 
you know, as a volunteer to coming in here and trying to make, you know, the, the planning commission a better process and to ultimately make the city a better place to live. So, um, you know, I'm, I'll have to be honest, I'm pretty disappointed she's not going to be continuing with us and I personally can't understand the, the city council's decision in this. I mean, I, I think if this was over at another place with higher standards, the two women would have been picked. Um, I mean, I think that the four people that voted not to have Judith on the commission, you know, if they were at the university, they probably would have been fired for something like that because it's just um, for someone without experience not to retain her on the commission. And I mean, you need help in the future from the standpoint of the coastal element, um, still the planning commission, a general plan, the gateway, and just to let somebody with that experience um, walk away is just very disappointing. And I don't understand it at all, but they seem to think there was a time for change um, because she had been here maybe too long on the planning commission. But I think that's so embarrassing, that argument from the standpoint, we could say that about our leaders in the city that have been here for decades. And we don't say to them, hey, uh, I think it's time for you to step aside and let somebody else get in place. So I don't buy that argument at all. I think, you know, what I've said all along with this process that it's, um, it's being rushed. And I think um, probably they looked at Judith, in my opinion, that someone that has, has um, you know, asked a lot of questions and is kind of dragging the process out a little bit more than they want. Um, so that's my personal belief from the standpoint when the city council actually gave you a, a July deadline. It's like, how can the city council even give you a deadline? They have people that have zero experience and to give a deadline would take somebody with a lot of experience to know how long it, to judge a project. So I think some of the problems started right at that, that time where after that, we had a lot of rule changes. We didn't hear from the public, you know, it's all called special sessions after that. And it was very limiting to the public. And it was also, I think, limiting to Judith, where I think for the first time you wanted to have a timer on her. So thank you again, Judith, for all your help. Thanks. I would like to cede my time to Fred Wise. Yes, good evening, commissioners. Um, I'm Fred Wise with Arcata1.com. First, a very big thank you to Commissioner Mayor for what I believe 16 years of service and all your wonderful contributions and diverging viewpoints that all contributed to a better planning commission process and a better Arcata for the past and the future. Thank you. Um, I wrote to the commission about the newly expanded page on the arcada1.com website. It has all the documents that you're working on all in one place, the general plan, the environmental impact report, the housing element, the gateway area plan, the gateway form based code, the urban field study site testing report, and the local coastal plan, coastal plan and more. And there are links also to the original documents on the city of Arcata's website all in one place. It's very easy to find. It's on the home page, it's on the menus, and it's on the Council Commission portal page. Um, if you have not yet read Andrea Tuttle's comments on the draft EIR, I encourage you to do so. Uh, my comments run to 88 pages. Hers is about three pages, much easier and quicker to read. Um, at some point, the Commission will be reviewing the gateway code, the form based code, I request that this be scheduled well in advance so that members of the public can send their comments in and we don't just find out about it when we get the packet on Friday afternoon. I will point out there's a lot that needs to be corrected in this code. I will point out that the 3D images that are show a potential build out of the gateway code, that those images do not comply with the code itself. Um, Next, I have a subject that uh, I'm going to bring up now and maybe talking about in the future. At our, uh, the Commission's February 13th meeting, we had a discussion about the security gates. And one of the asides came up is that the security gates at Humboldt Harbor Dashery were approved uh, incorrectly by the planning department. They should have come to you. Uh, we have as an example of another 
uh, incorrect approval, the large and ugly example of the fence at the data center on 11th Street. It was approved given gateway, given zoning administrator approval, even though that does not meet code. When projects come before you in the last two years, um, they're approved fairly quickly. Uh, the one example is uh, the Julian Berg Valley East Lofts project was approved in 31 minutes. Others take an hour. Even when there's public comment, it could be two hours. The, um, with uh, ministerial review, we have objective standards. If a project meets the standards, as you know, it has to be approved. It is not like what I call the old days. Something that happened with the, the village where it took months and months, that cannot happen again by state law. And the director can tell you about this. Things have to be approved. Um, what I'm suggesting is that essentially all projects come before the commission. Anything bigger than a single family house, which there's probably not gonna be any in the gateway plan. I see lots of advantages to that. One, the main one is that you'll have seven sets of eyes, seven brains looking at the project. You may see things that are not in compliance with code or make suggestions. Um, as came up uh, the meeting two weeks ago, uh, the laundry was added by one of the commissioners. That would not have been, if that had gone through zoning administrator approval, it would probably would be built without the laundry. The, um, if something is approved by zoning administrator approval, we might not find out about anything that's wrong with it until after the foundations are in or after the building is built. And that is too late in my, my view. Um, I don't see any downside to having projects come before the commission. I've talked to two architects who voiced their opinion that they like having things come before the commission because it makes them be more rigorous and make their pres presentation and look at everything. Um, the, uh, I, I spoke with Redwood City. Uh, they said that when projects come before them, they sail through because, because of the objective standards of the farm-based code. Developers know what's required and they do a project accordingly. Um, that's my pitch, and I'm gonna keep repeating it. I don't see any downside. If there's fees problem, that could be waived perhaps, but at this point, the whole gateway situation is an experiment. The use of form-based code is an experiment. Sometimes I read this and look at how, how is a developer going to take advantage of different, you know, looseness or loopholes that are, that are in all the codes that you carefully design. It's going to happen. You know you're gonna be modifying the code. As it is now, you're, you're set up to modify it on a two-year basis. I think that's not good enough. There could be a lot of bad projects occur before that happens. And again, if there is a downside to the projects coming for you, I would like to hear about it. Thanks. Thanks for your work. Thank you, Fred. Do we have Zoom speakers? We do. Go ahead, uh, iPhone. Uh, this is actually James Becker. Go, go, in a go ahead, James, vehicle, and but hopefully it's coming through. We're not hearing you very well. All right, well. thank you, Dan. Um, I just want to, okay, so I'll do my best. Uh, I do want to thank Commissioner Mayor for all of her years of service. Um, I would say personally that, you know, her ideas have not always, you know, aligned with mine, but I've always appreciated the level that she has um, dedicated to uh, preparing herself for the topics and presenting herself to subject. Um, in depth at the knowledge of how the city runs and, and, and in planning. Anyway, and I thank you for that. Uh, I think it's a disservice that you are not asked to serve longer, but I do appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um, that's all the online comments that we have. Okay, with that, we will close oral communications. Thank you all for your input. Uh, we have two items on the consent calendar. Uh, approved planning commission minutes from our regular meeting February 13th, 2024. And approved planning commission minutes from our regular meeting March 12th, 2024. Would anyone like to pull an item off consent or do we have a motion? Um, I 
would like to pull both of those. I think they need to be modified. Okay. Um, now with that, we'll move on to um, discussing that one at a time. Can you go through it? Yeah, the, the first uh, is the minutes of February 13 under 5A where I recused myself from that matter. Um, the minutes show that I actually voted on the, on the item, which is incorrect. So my name should be stricken from the eyes on that one. And if I can do a, that would be part A of my, I'll make a motion. And then the second part would be um, the minutes of March 12 and the discussion of the public hearing under 5A. Um, it does mention that I recused myself, but that's after a discussion that appears to be in kind of chronological order. Um, I just like to modify those minutes by moving my recusal to the first item under 5A and then go on to the staff report. City staff. I'm sorry, you want to make, make it so that the sentence stating that you recused yourself is the first item? Uh, first statement. Yeah, that's correct. Because otherwise, if you're reading it, it sounds chronological, and then it says I wouldn't have recused myself until after the discussion, which is not what happened. Okay. If the rest of the commission is okay with those changes and there's no further discussion. I'm happy to second that motion. Okay. Motion with changes. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 I'm sorry, you have to do a roll call vote. Oh, I'm, yeah, forgot about that. And would you like me to do that? Or is that coming from Jennifer? You can do that. Okay, Commissioner Simmons? Aye. Joel? Aye. Commissioner Mayor? Aye. Commissioner Lehman? Aye. And I, from Chair Tangney, Vice Chair Tangney. Uh, motion passes. And we can move on. Uh, we have no public hearings tonight, so we will move on to business items. We have three business items. The first item of which is to find the 2024 20, updates of the 2023 to 2027 capital improvement program consistent with the general plan. Can we begin with the staff report? Uh, yes, uh, good evening, uh, Chairperson and member of the public here. Uh, so the item in front of you today is our um, part of our CIP, uh, which we start normally at the budget process. So as we are in the budget, we are adding projects and removing projects. Um, sorry, I'm not fully prepared for this uh, staff report. Um, I was here just to give an update on the project, but <clears throat> well, every year we come in front of you to make sure the projects that we are moving forward for the moving forward are consistent with our general plan. So in that process, we this year we have added five new projects and we have removed 13 projects from the prior list. So also with your staff report, you will see 13 um, projects that were approved in the past and out of that 13 projects will be coming out because those projects have been completed this year and in last year. So they will be removed and as a part of, we'll be adding five new projects and I, will not go in detail on each project uh, since I have in front of me, so I will just give you a brief, brief overview of each project. If you're interested, if not, you can ask me questions and we can go, we can respond to your questions. So the best way you want to handle that. Okay, thank you. Are there commissioner questions about the uh, capital improvement plan? Um, so the very first uh, project on the new project list uh, is Project 4516, 11th and K, K Street Improvements, uh, and there's $7,000 for public outreach. Um, I had a conversation uh, with Director Loya, and I suggested that instead of spending $7,000 on public outreach, uh, you could spend that money on building a quick build uh, version of these improvements. So this would be a very cheap, very temporary sort of display of the improvements so that people can see and experience it and sort of do outreach in that manner mm -hmm. rather than in a more traditional manner. 
Um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Director David seemed interested in the idea, and I wanted to run it all by run it by you. Okay, uh, Commission. Any deliberations on that? Yeah, can I add something? Um, Please, yes. I, I, I agree with Matt. I did not understand how seven thousand dollars of public outreach money would provide traffic calming. I mean, how 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 are you going to spend that? $7,000 to calm traffic. I I don't get it. I mean, I, I agree with Matt. I, you're much better off spending it on, I don't know, improving the bike lane. And our, I mean, the project description is very uh, favorable. You know, having better bicycle safety and pedestrian safety on those streets would be wonderful, but how are you going to do it? Natra, please. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so, as you know, uh, K Street from Samoa to 13th and 11th Street from Bayview to all the way to, uh, to Jane's Road has been a priority project and has come to Transportation Safety Committee and at uh, council meetings, and a lot of people have expressed concerns about people speeding, uh, not having a proper signage. So with that in mind, we have included this project for this year to start. Uh, if you remember six months ago or maybe eight months ago, I came here and presented eight different options of what we could do on K Street. Um, we, have, we didn't select what we're going to do. So what we plan to do in next three months or next six months is try to do a public engagement and try to see how best we can pick one of the options from that. Instead of just picking one option, that's traffic coming. Yes, definitely we know speed humps will work, signage would work, um, bulb outs will work, or removing parking will work, or adding bike lanes would work. But we wanted to ensure that we get a public input before we implement those. So currently we have a contract with RCA to help us with the public engagement in next three to six months. And after that, once we select the traffic calming measures, we will implement those. And definitely that will be more expensive than $7,000. This $7,000 is just for working with um, RCA and the city staff doing public engagement, public partnership, and trying to see how best we can improve the traffic calming on 11th Street and K Street, which has been the priority projects. And I, I think one of the questions um, that came up uh, was whether part of that engagement could be having some of the ideas built out into the, the street. So if that was part of the engagement to have kind of a, uh, like a live charrette, if you will. Well, not really. We were not thinking of live charrettes or uh, pop-up demonstration, uh, but that could be in included. Uh, currently, it's not in RCA's scope to do that. Um, let me say one more time. I, I think you know the answer, in Nature. You you know what will work. I don't. I don't think anyone in the public would disagree with you. I would spend the seven thousand dollars doing something. I, I just had a, a question because my recollection, and I'm not sure whether I was on the commission at this point or not, but. I thought the commission gave direction or suggestion as to how they wanted K Street to function, at least on a temporary basis before there was funding for a more permanent uh, separated bike trail. Did, did this is this is specifically 11th Street, though, in Bayview. Uh, is that right? No, th this is both. And um, I don't think we received a direction on which we presented the options. Um, but I don't think we received direction from council or from the planning commissioners which options to move forward with. And that's what we're trying to do. We will be presenting those options and beyond those options for 11th Street and K Street. And once we have a project, we're coming back to the council for the approval. So the, um, the planning commission did have a lot of conversations around K Street, um, in particular when we were discussing the you know couplet uh, between K and L. 
and uh, some of the traffic improvements. Um, as Nature mentioned, he came and presented several options that the engineering department pulled together as, as uh, you know, things that could be done on K Street, different um, choices. Um, and the, the Planning Commission absolutely did make some pretty strong recommendations at that time. Um, the City Council is the body that makes the ultimate decision as to how to implement those. And so um, the, the process that we're going through, well, you know, I agree with Commissioner Lehman. I think that many people would probably agree with a proposal that engineering would put out. Um, I, would, uh, I would, you know, counter maybe just softly that, um, you know, Arcata has a lot of very engaged people who have different and varied interests. And almost anything that you do in any community, but certainly in the city of Arcata that has something to do with parking is not going to be universally adopted. Um, and so I, part of part of what we're doing here is to, um, you know, to do the public engagement, to be able to provide the city council and the planning commission with the information they need to be able to make those project decisions. And I think, um, you know, to the, the point that you made, Commissioner Simmons, about whether or not some of this could be, um, you know, used to, to do some pop-ups in the field, I think, um, you know, we're not going to use the entire amount to do that. We've got a contract with uh, RCAA, but, uh, but that, that sounds like it's an option that could be considered. Yes, definitely. It's possible. Well, yeah, just to clarify, I'm not talking about doing things without community outreach, right? The, the idea here is to get better community outreach by actually demonstrating it to the community rather than just talking about it in abstract sort of ways. Um, yeah, I, uh, I debated whether or not sending you guys a little article about these quick build projects where for like $5,000 you can very quickly put out like what this would look like if we built it out with concrete uh, and people can experience it and then they could give feedback having lived that reality. Um, so I, I guess I would strongly encourage uh, the city and RCAA to look into that uh, in their community outreach. Yes, definitely. We can look into pop-up demonstration. We were talking about that. We had not planned that out, but yes, definitely. And that's one of the options that we could look into. Thank you. And perhaps that article could be forwarded to the decision-making group, the RCAA, and you know, be part of the discussion. All right, anybody want to pull anything else or talk about anything else? Judith, please. Um, I'd like to ask about the Reconnecting Arcata project. Um, and I'm assuming it's on the list here because uh, of the need to fund the initial stages with grants. Karen Deemer cited a figure, um, I think, joking, but not unrealistically, of a billion dollars. Um, and so I think given the magnitude of what some folks are thinking, um, a brief explanation would really help. So, so thank you for that. So recently, I would say three weeks ago, we were selected by Caltrans as a pilot project for reconnecting Arcata project as a part of Reconnecting Communities High Vitality Boulevard program. So we currently we don't know what that exactly project will look like. So again, as with any project, we will be starting the process. The first phase of the project will be public engagement and public partnership, and that will evolve in a, some sort of a project in coming years. So the reason is here because we have the grant and we'll be starting working towards the project. So that's why we put in the list and we'll be moving forward with the project. Um, when we submitted the application, like just to give you maybe a little bit background, as you know, uh, City of Arcata is divided by 101 in two pieces. And also on north, there is 299 and on the south is 255. So we as engineers or Caltrans have realized that in last 50 years or last 80 years, we have constructed a lot of highways and streets for the development, for the better economy, and we looked at as as a development. But you know, now we are taking pause when we say we as a group in the transportation industry and looking at, yes, we did that, but in that process, we have divided communities. We can see the best example in Arcata, how 101 divides like East and West Arcata people. There's not a better connectivity. Before the highways, there were like 18 blocks of streets crossing in, in East-West directions. 
but since the build of highway there are only five to seven and most of them are not even bike and pet friendly if you look at the bridge on 255 it does not have a bike lane does not have a sidewalk similarly the same condition so we are trying to improve that hence we submitted the great application working with our local partners including edgecog uh, cal poly humboldt caltrans um, hta we work together to put this great application together and they love the uh, project hence they are want to move forward with us as a pilot project so in next six to eight months you will see a very um, robust or strong public engagement partnership that will be happening and you will be invited to that and you can provide feedback how you want to see Arcada, uh, reconnected Arcada in future. I think that's the goal. How as a public we all want to see Arcada connected back. Uh, you know, we, highway will remain in place. Definitely vehicles will be able to travel north and south, east and west, but how we want to connect so it's much more connected um, for the people who, who want to use east and west side. So that's the idea behind the whole reconnecting Arcada project. Thank you for that. Anybody else? Any other items? Yeah, I have a question, Natra, on the old Arcata Road project. The total cost is shown as four million. And I I have two questions. The estimated total project cost is shown as two hundred and six thousand, which is confusing. And I what is the description of that? project is that the roundabout on old arcade road uh, just a minute let me look at this uh, thank you peter and thank you for your confidence on the earlier item on 11th and k yes um yeah, definitely we have good solutions um, but i don't think everybody's going to love my solution on 11th or k street so i appreciate your confidence in me and in the engineering department um, so back to your um, answer, our question is total project cost is four million and that's an old number that was based on our initial engineer's estimate two years ago. Uh, we got the bids, um, bid came at around five million dollars so it's a little bit more than five million dollars the actual cost of the project is. Uh, the division here is 2.38 and 841 numbers are based on the source of grants. So we are receiving $2.38 million from STIP, State Transportation Improvement Program, and then 841 through Highway Improvement Program. So that's how it's divided. It's not mm, the cost of the project, but it is the cost, but it's a division of how the money is coming for the, to fund the project. And the remainder will be coming from our um, local street funds. The limit of the project is just um, south of Buttermilk, where the crosswalk is on the Bayside Road or whatever farm is, that's where the project starts and it terminates at the intersection of uh, Jacoby Creek and Old Arcata Road, um, where we will be putting a new roundabout. All the street from, it's almost approximately one mile of pavement um, walkway, at least on the one side, uh, which is the west side. Um, bike lanes, striped crosswalk, uh, rapid flashing, uh, some lighting um, at, at the roundabout, uh, rapid flashes at the roundabout, a lot of concrete walkways uh, along the roundabout. So that's a brief description of the project. Okay. And the 206000 is that what you're going to spend this year? What? Or is that just the typo? Uh, that number is also source of funding at one phase of the work when we did initial design. So that is a leftover from the prior list uh, from two years ago. Okay, thanks. And I just want to be uh, clear for the commission and for the public that um, this exhibit B, uh, where we've been identifying the uh, holdovers from last year, uh, this this list is not part of what's being adopted as the consistency determination. Only the first page, uh, Exhibit 1, that's part of Attachment A, uh, is actually what you're reviewing for consistency. Uh, when we brought this forward last year, uh, Commissioner Mayor was curious to see what were the other projects that were on the list um, that you weren't looking at for new consistency, just so you could see in some total. And so that's why um, Attachment B is here. 
uh, with all of the um, the other projects on here. And so it sounds like there's maybe a little bit of cleanup um, that needs to be done on, on this uh, uh, attachment, but that's not subject to your review tonight. Thank you for that clarity. Are there any other commission questions, particularly about Exhibit 1 on this? Seeing none, I'll ask about Mountain View Park. Where is it? Is also a community project that our environmental services department is leading. So this Mountain View Park is at the end of 11th Street, uh, ne next to the Hager, the small park. And we will be doing some improvement, but before that we'll be doing some public engagement and see what the neighborhood wants to see in the park. And that's the initial cost of $2,000 for initial public engagement. And after that, we'll be doing improvements to that, like other parks. So it's beyond Jane's back in the subdivision there? Yes. Yeah, beyond Greenview Market. Okay. Yes, right. beyond Greenview, beyond Greenview Park in that neighborhood, just east of that. Okay, thank you. Well, yeah, Matt. Please. Sorry, just before we close this item, is there, I know Peter's into it, is there other commissioners who are interested in sort of giving like formal direction uh, to have a sort of quick build demonstration project of 11th and K improvements uh, for bike and pedestrian safety? rather than uh, sort of traditional public outreach. The, the uh, question here would be, uh, that's not an item of, oh yeah, it is. So it is on exhibit one, so. Uh, you, you can certainly make that recommendation yeah. to the council. There's, yeah, th that's um, clearly within your purview to make that recommendation. Okay, so if we pass this item and all are in agreement, it would just be tagged on as, okay. Yeah, Judith. Yeah, I, 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 th I think um, considering that council members actually do listen to these meetings they'll they'll hear this um, that kind of proposal is very consistent with the idea of um, tac tactical urbanism um, typically w what happened in the old days was groups of residents would come and paint the street themselves on a Saturday or some Sunday morning um, and challenge the city to make sure that um, it remains safe during the day in recent years, cities have embraced that approach um, and have started out with the idea that testing out different options is um, a way of making sure they work and it's fun and it's a very concrete, quite literally, way of getting public support. Um, the $7,000 here um, probably wouldn't quite cover a city effort to do it that way um, and 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 yet that's that would be a different kind of item and it might not come in under capital improvements um, especially if it weren't permanent it would come in on under some other budget that the city council would um, have the purview to allocate so but you're in favor of sort of recommending it yeah, I, 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 I think it's a great idea if someone um, has, has the desire and the funds to do it in a safe way. So the straw poll is unanimous. Um, so to move this item forward, uh, do we need a motion and then a roll call? Do you need to get from the public first? Oh, thank you. Thank you, public, for speaking up. <laughs> Uh, let me get um, back to my you, you agenda. Absolutely need to take public comment, and you uh, do need a, a motion to adopt resolution number PC2402, and I would suggest you amend that to also make a recommendation to the city council to have some element of the um, 11th Street and K Street projects be a pop-up. So if you want to get that motion out of the way and then accept public comment, you can, or if you want to take public comment first, it's up to you. Yeah, I'd rather take public comment first if you guys don't mind thank you public Good evening. Um, I'm a, a little confused about the worried about seven thousand dollars because uh, a big project we had with the eighth and ninth street improvement which was right on that list there you realize that that project was for the public outreach and for engineering was eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars I was there the night the City Council voted for that and I was kind of shocked from the amount that it was and they were like, don't worry about it, it's free money, we're getting it from the state, you know, it's not coming out of our, 
and, you know, and I was a little shocked about how much it was. So, um, you know, I'm just giving you that in comparison to the 7,000, but let's use that as an example of why we need the public input and why I think he's right about this. It's like we had a workshop and some things were missed in that workshop. And I'll have to say that it's two blocks on each side of the co-op, only going up to K Street. Um, you know, we did, nobody mentioned what the effect that was going to have on the co-op, which was three openings on K, on 8th and two, three openings on 9th Street. Now we have one opening on each of those streets. And it's basically, from the co-op's perspective, not a very nice thing. They lost 20 parking spots. And I've seen the stress test over Christmas time when, you know, people start backing out of that one little entrance there. Now the rest of the street can't get in. So it backed up all the traffic. And so this is going to be the, the problem in the future when we have more of a population. So we kind of missed the boat on that one. And what was the point of the 8th and 9th Street? I mean, it, you got bicycle lanes, that's good, it looks good, but you go to K Street, okay, and I thought this was trying to link to the creamery. We get up to the next block, and on the left-hand side, we have a Victorian house that has about eight or nine parking spots that are like a big driveway open up, so that's gonna give you some engineering channel uh, problems in the future. We get to the creamery building. What's the creamery at the front of the playhouse? This was on your, your drawings at one time that was supposed to be a sidewalk there. This is the busiest spot in the whole one of the, the town for walking, and there isn't even a, a sidewalk there. And the reason you probably don't have a sidewalk is because this is, we're talking about the north side of the creamery and the playhouse. That's about 20 parking spots where it's just basically asphalt that goes from the street, you know, cross your invisible sidewalk there and goes up against the building. So if you actually put a sidewalk there, there isn't going to be any more parking there. And this will have a, pro it's already going to be a problem in the future because I've walked by there almost every night and your busier nights, the parking on the streets is already full. You haven't even built anything. So this is why we need to have public input uh, out uh, contributing to this because you know, there's a lot of things that are getting missed and you just think it's like, oh, spray paint some paint on the road and we're okay. It's a lot more complicated than that. Thank you. Thank you, Gregory. Hi, commissioners. Thank you. I'm Fred Wise. A um, couple of small items. Um, pay, packet pages 18, 19 show past and recently completed CIP projects. Uh, they're done with a strike through. Uh, for next year's, I would prefer it not be done with a strike through. It would be more legible, uh, just the, stating that they are past and recently completed projects. Um, if a person wanted more information about any of these projects, I've had mixed results uh, on the city website or Googling. Um, it would be nice if some of the stuff were more accessible. Um, there is a document. Uh, on the city, 72 page document of capital improvement projects from 2023, 24 th through 2027, 2028. So it's a, a, more than a year old, about a year and a half old. Uh, but it's a, it's a very good read. And I'll put it on arcata1.com for anyone who wants easy access to it. Thanks. Thank you, Fred. Anybody else from the public wish to comment on this item? Nobody on Zoom, so we'll close public comment. Um, is there any discussion on this item, or do we have a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion uh, to adopt uh, the capital improvement program with my modification uh, that we are also recommending that the $7,000 of public outreach be used uh, to do a quick build demonstration project uh, on 11th and K in order to receive more community input on the project. There's second. A, we have a motion and a second, and we need to do a roll call vote. Commissioner Mayor? Yes. Commissioner Yodowitz? Aye. Commissioner Simmons? Aye. Commissioner Lehman? Aye. And I vote yes also. Motion carries. Okay, so now we move on to recommend approval of the 2023 General Plan Annual Progress Report. Can we 
begin with a staff report, please. Absolutely. So the item before you tonight is our annual general plan annual report. Um, we've been bringing these to you since 2019, so I believe this is the fifth one uh, that you've seen. Really, it goes over highlights of accomplishments, things that the city has completed. Um, one thing to make note of is definitely our housing element numbers. That's something that we've been doing a report on for ever. But it's something that I know is interesting. Um, I've reorganized this report a little bit from the last one that you received. I tried to organize it based on how our general plan is organized, so by sections, so that it's a little easier to read. Um, I probably do not have every single um, every single policy or implementation measure that could apply, but wanted to pick some that were pretty relevant to the activities that were completed this year for the city. This is something that's required for us to send to um, the Office of Planning and Research annually, um, and we're looking for a recommendation for, uh, for from Planning Commission to um, to approve this and move it forward to City Council so it would be going to the next City Council meeting. If you have any questions about anything that's on here, I'd be happy to answer it. Um, I'm excited and proud of the work that we've done towards our housing element RENA numbers. So I would like to just point out the fact that we're at about 79% of our total uh, RENA allocation, regional housing needs allocation, and we should be at about 62.5% right now. So that's a pretty good, pretty good place to be for us. Thank you, staff. Uh, commissioner questions, clarities? Can I point out one thing? I, the resolution did not get attached to um, the APR in our uh, in your staff report. So we've pulled it up here, um, and I have copies here on the table as well. I just wanted to make sure you knew that. Thank you. OK, yes, Mr. Simmons. Um, so I actually think I said this as a public commenter almost exactly a year ago, the last time there was a RENA update. Um, but I really think we should think of RENA numbers as a floor and not a ceiling. Um, you know, I'm happy that we're meeting our targets, uh, but I mean, if you just walk around outside, I think it's really clear that we're not providing enough housing for our very low income. Even if we currently are at 118% of our state demanded housing levels, I think just as a community, we should acknowledge that we're not providing enough housing um, for all of the members of our community. Um, and so I'm, I'm happy we're doing this. It's good to see progress. I think we should be shooting for going way past uh, what the state is requiring us to provide uh, for our community members. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Other comments or questions? I have a, a question. Um, I, I understand that the main motivation for this report at this time is for OPR. Um, but I, I would love to think of these reports as progress reports directed primarily um, to the citizens of Arcata rather than to um, a, a state agency out there who will put it in a file after saying, yep, put it on the check and it disappears. Um, to that end, it, I'm wondering if when it goes to the state city council, um, we could also, in addition to simply listing um, achievements in line with general plan policies, note which of those are going to move further with the general plan update and the local coastal program that we're working on right now, um, because Without that, it, it is a way less useful document. Um, and I think OPR would accept it with that as well. That wouldn't abuse what they require from the city, and it would make it a way more useful document um, to the city itself. So I, I, I think it's, it's there. It would just be a matter of saying, oh, yeah, and our next steps um, are here. and then it's going to be a lot easier to do next year's report because, um, you know, sort of like the capital improvement program, you've kind of got it all all out there. 
So one thing just before David steps in, because I think he has something to, to mention on this as well. I should have also mentioned that when our general plan updates are approved, we will be redesigning this to flow with that particular document as well. And there will be a lot more to report on a lot more information because one of the things that they do like to see is what were the updates, what were the changes, and kind of have that in this uh, report. So next year's report will probably be much larger and in a different, similar but different format. So just, and I know David had something else. Yeah, thank you for uh, that, Commissioner Mayor. I think um, we've been thinking a lot about that in our shop as well. Um, and we've we've really gone from a place where the annual performance reports were, were wrote um, and um, have tried to make them more informative. Uh, I feel like the work that uh, Senior Planner Freitas did on uh, improving um, the report uh, was really good over the last couple of years. And then, um, you know, Jen, Jen did some upgrades this time, but what we'd really like these to be is something that we're working on throughout the year, um, collaborating with different departments, collaborating with the community, and being able to uh, use the APR as a way to, uh, you know, kind of show what's going on with the implementation uh, measures that are in the general plan, as opposed to just focusing on, you know, a series of, you know, random policies, uh, frankly. Um, you know, that we've made progress in. And so we're hoping to transform this into something that is more a document that shows accountability and uh, transparency in the, uh, in the implementation of the general plan. Um, so yeah, I, I appreciate your comments and we've been thinking about them and, and talking about how we can, uh, you know, we've been looking at different structures, you know, some similar to the capital improvement program. I think that's a really good, um, you know, parallel. Um, to um, to be able to you know com convey a, a large body of information effectively in a way that uh, you know folks can understand it and hopefully have some buy into it. So thank you for that. I'd also like to mention that it will be up on the website once it's approved by City Council. So it should be going to the uh, April third meeting, I believe. Good discussion. Uh, anything else before we open public comment? No? All right. With that, let's open public comment on this item. Gregory Daggett again. You notice how it says noise, public safety, and air quality. I'll first start out with noise. Uh, it's, been t it's been two years since I, we were th three mayors ago. I'll, I'll say I sent a letter to her, and basically she and I was complaining about the noise element from the standpoint of all the vehicles in the, that are changing their exhaust systems on the streets and she in this letter that I shared with David just recently she said I totally agree with you we're not enforcing this and maybe sometime in the future when we rebuild our arcade of fire I mean our police we will we'll do something about it so you know I waited two years and we, re we rebuilt the the police that same um, mayor from two years ago came to my house and gave me the heads up we're actually going to be hiring folks and we're gonna take care of this problem. Unfortunately, that never came true. So uh, I'm just a little surprised on the noise thing that we're, we're saying that that's so important to us where I've exhausted myself in front of this commission, city council, police, been very patient and nothing has been done. And it's actually one of the reasons I don't really believe too much what's gonna happen in the city because it's actually a pretty simple problem to take care of. It just, if you went out with the police and basically stopped people that were uh, violating the laws of the state of California, they'd get a fix it ticket and they would also go on social media and tell their friends, hey, time to like adjust our exhaust and get it back under control, problem would be done. You, we can't seem to do that. Public safety, the next area, I've had lots of conversations on this since we're bicycle lanes, great, great idea. But the problem is that from the public safety standpoint, our police are not stopping speeders going through the city. There's a lot of crazy stuff that I see where I live all the time, flipping upside down, all, all these kind of, I mean, people crawl out of their cars and tell me how they're high on drugs and I watch the police. They're very nice, actually, but I, you wonder on cannabis what the what actually is the test for that because they told me that before they arrived. So I can't agree with the public safety that we're doing a very good job because I just see cars being smashed, parked on our streets, and, and more than any place I've ever lived. And I've lived in places much bigger populations in this city, 
And the, the air quality part of it too, this is the, I think the first, I've lived in a lot of different cities in California from the north, central, and they all do air quality because you get that an, pretty annoying thing that a lot of people face when you have older cars, you have to get smog and prove that your, your exhaust is within the limits. I think Humple, you don't have to do that at all. So I question whether we even understand what our air quality is from that standpoint, because there's no smog test done on these vehicles. And the ones that I'm saying are changing are also, some of them are smokers on purpose for fun. So that's what I have to say to that, thanks. Thank you, Greg. Yes, good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you to Jen Dart and everyone who had a hand in putting this report together. Um, I just want to make a few comments. Um, there's the Regional Housing Needs Progress Report, page eight in the report, page 29 in your packet. Um, it shows, as we know, the, the city is meeting its goals for very low, low and moderate income but it is falling very far behind for above moderate income housing. The uh, need allocation was 262 units. The city shows 94 units in the housing cycle, which is 36% of the goal. This is what the realtors are telling us. There's a shortage of housing. There's a shortage of housing across the board. I'll agree with Commissioner Simmons, but there's particularly a shortage of housing for people who want to buy homes. Um, in this report, there's housing element HM1 policy, which says it's the promotion of owner-occupied units. I'll quote, increased proportion of owner-occupied units in Arcata by increasing the number of homeowners living in the city and reducing the number of absentee homeowners. I don't think that this is being pursued. I'm not saying it's an easy prospect, but it is there in writing. Um, the commission had a presentation by a representative from the Humboldt Association of Realtors in August of 2022. Their letter to the commission is on arcata1.com. Uh, they requested a 10% requirement for owner-occupied units in the Gateway Area Plan. We've discussed this. There's no law that says that you can require it. We understand this, but as it's turning out, the ratio of owner-occupied homes to rental units in Arcata, which is now at about 36 or 33 percent to 67 percent, is going to get worse, not better. It would take a lot of owner-occupied housing to make that percentage better. Again, I'm not complaining to the commission. I'm not complaining to um, community development director. We know these are facts, but it's spelled out very clearly in that chart of the need allocation of above moderate at 36%. Just wanted to make the point, thanks. Thank you, Fred. Anybody else from the public wish to speak on this item? Do we have any online? No? Nope. Okay, we'll close public comment. I forgot to ask one question of you, Jennifer. Um, there's reference in here on packet page 27 about um, on multi-use pathways about the right-of-way still being controlled by NCRA and I thought NCRA had been totally dissolved out as a entity. Is it not Great Red Redwood Trail even through Arcata or? No, that's correct. We'll, we'll fix that. Okay. All right. Um, any other deliberations? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, that's in one of the policies. These policies are verbatim out of the uh, general plan. Okay. So they so it just stays. They're antiquated. Yeah, yeah it'll antiquated. stay. Sorry, we're not going to change that. Okay. Thank you. That's fine. All right. Any other questions or deliberations or a motion? Is it possible? To, I, I haven't seen the full text of the resolution. Um, so we could either scroll it or pass it out so we know what we're voting on. Thank you. Could you? Please share the screen on that so I could read it. Can you read it, Peter? Uh, Is it up there on your screen? Yeah, but it's only in one little, well, yeah, kind of. You're straining me. <laughs> Yeah, I can read Sorry it. Sorry about that. 
Peter, can you switch your view so that you're in presentation mode, then you should be able to see full screen. I, I, I can read it. Thanks, David. Um, Dan, can yeah. I make a comment too? I agree with what uh, with Matt's earlier comment about housing. Do we want to include something alluding to that in in our report to the city council, saying that yes, we agree with the progress report, but that um we encourage the city to not just try to meet the requirements but exceed them the housing requirements i don't know i'm making this up as i go along but um it seemed to me that what matt pointed out is important and should be communicated to the council I'm, yeah, I think I think you know, but I'm more than happy to include something like that in our. Well, my question for clarity is that the Rena numbers are seen as the minimum, right? And going beyond is always a goal. So it would just be emphasizing that we do always want to go as far beyond as possible. Is that? Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay, Matt, if you'd like to make the motion and put that into some kind of phrase that. I'll make a motion to put that into some kind of phrase. I guess um, <laughs> the phrase would be something like uh, the city of Arcata uh, encourages housing production above and beyond state mandated uh, arena numbers. And is there a motion to approve this resolution? Um, before, you I, I, before you make I, a motion. I'm happy to move with... Uh, the addition of Matt's statement. Okay, hold on just a second, Peter. We have a comment. Yeah, I'm just wondering if before you make that motion, if you want to um, make it stronger, we could add a whereas to the resolution. And um, that that way you, you get it with the cover page and you still get it in the text of the report. I think that's a good idea, Judith. That sounds Can I great. propose something for you? Yes, please. Um, whereas the City of Arcata Planning Commission views the uh, the arena numbers as a floor and not a ceiling, and encourages uh, the city to produce housing to meet its actual need, as opposed to the state mandated um, floor. Yeah, I like that. Okay. I like that too. Okay. Now, can we turn this into a motion? <laughs> I make that motion uh, that we adopt this with the uh, language provided by Director Loya. I second. Okay, we have a motion from Commissioner Simmons and a second from um, Commissioner Lehman. And we need to do a roll call vote. Commissioner Mayor? Yes. Yodowitz? Aye. Layman? Aye. Simmons? Aye. And I vote as well in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay, thank Thanks, you. Thanks, everyone. That's good. Um, now, last item of our business items is to consider outstanding general plan recommendations. Um, as I understand it, this item is to wrap up the work that we started at our last meeting. We adopted modifications to the framework for our discussions to carry us through these conversations. I see you've included the updated framework, that's 4.2 in our packet, um, as attachment A. I also see the table tracking our discussions as updated to reflect Commissioner Mayer's comments. 
Does staff have any other items to report? No, I don't. Okay, seeing none. Um, let's see, thank you. Are there any questions from commissioners before we, oh, are, uh, so they, that's it, no staff report is, is that? I mean, the only thing I'll tell you is that I've got the uh, table up on the screen here, and if, as you get into them, I'll, I'll go ahead and like I did last time, track okay. the conversation and the final vote. All right, so um, I think then we just need to jump right into public comment on this item. And then we'll revisit, okay? Public comment is open. Don't all go at once. <laughs> okay. Um, you had to reject the G Street to avoid uh, sea level rise. Um, that was an interesting one. This is um, something that's um, pretty important from that standpoint. So it's, it's uh, I'm not quite a, a agreeing with where you're going with this, but it's. Um, something that is definitely going to be affected by sea level rise and it's tied into uh, a lot of different things from the standpoint of the Coastal Commission and their jurisdiction on this and um, I think the plan is to build up the, the levee system to, and um, I think that's going to be highly problematic so I would advise to really you know have more discussions on this because there seems to be very little discussion in this area. And this is, this, this is also tied to the wastewater treatment plant, which is uh, you, when very few people re read the Coastal um, Commission when they approved phase one of that proposal. And there was a lot of um, things that were added to that and restrictions, and they weren't too happy about you know, building up the levees. This also kind of runs counter to uh, uh, I think your land acknowledgement when you start out the day with what was what was a, a significant impact back in 1850 and that was basically taking open water that was um, part of the bay and you know dumping dirt and rocks and that seems to be um, kind of like the plan for the future so I don't really see that fitting in with um, policies regarding you know our environment and uh, I'm surprised that there's not more environmentalists that are saying some, some things about this. But I do know that this is going to be a huge issue with the Coastal Commission. And, um, you know, I've brought this up a number of times from the standpoint of how um, building up our levees is not a good direction to go into the future. Not only is it very expensive, that water is going to go under these levees anyway and, and affect areas that. Um, from sea level rise, and uh, we've had Alderon Lair here talked about this. So I'm just kind of like really surprised that there's not been more discussion of that huge issue. Um, I mean, it's the biggest one of the biggest issues that we're facing, the university's facing, how it'll affect our wastewater treatment plant and um, the whole future. So it's not a little light little subject that we can just uh, talk about in um, 60 seconds. Thank you, Greg. I would like to cede my time to Fred Wise. Yes, good evening, commissioners. Um, I want to speak both on the framework and on the actual policies. Uh, on the framework, um, you worked hard to make a good framework. It worked well. Um, there are some things, but it gradually shifted over time, and I want to point some things out. Uh, previously, we had a schedule in advance of what you're going to be talking about at each session, so that was very helpful for the public to know uh, what was going on. Now, it's overall, and it's not so clear. Um, the updated uh, framework has a paragraph about en masse adoption of a group of items. It does not have anything about en masse rejection of a group of items. And that's what we saw uh, six weeks ago. Um, 
Another element of the framework that fell out of uh, use was the gradients of agreement. In the beginning, you did that quite a bit, and I like that. And we had the posters of how many fingers were raised, um, because not everyone feels strongly about something, as, as you know. Now, um, uh, in terms of uh, the policies uh, for um, policies from Commissioner Mayer, um, I want to put my um, support for what she says specifically. LU1Y, which is the having each infill opportunity zone have a um, form-based code to specify that. Um, this was discussed before, and it was argued that there's not confusion. I propose there's been a considerable amount of confusion because people have been asking me about it. And if you read Andrea Tuttle's letter, she's confused about it. And so just a, a sentence in there would make that really clear. You know that there's going to be a separate form-based code for each infill opportunity zone. The council knows it, but it's not clear in the wording. Uh, the other item she brings up that I want to comment on is uh, CM5E7, the no net loss of trails. I wrote a letter to the commission on this. Um, this was addressed two weeks ago. In my opinion, uh, Commissioner Tagney brought up, or Vice Chair Tagney, excuse me, brought up questions, concerns that were not actually addressed. If you look at the video or read the transcript, you'll see that they, your, uh, the um, Vice Chair Tagney's concerns were not addressed. In addition, we have some new information now that we didn't have uh, two weeks ago. And that is a quote from the Community Development Director. Quote, and this is regarding the trail, the existing class one shared bicycle pedestrian trail in the L Street Linear Park corridor. Uh, the quote is, so far as I know, at this point, the existing class one multi-use trail will remain in its current location, in its current configuration, in perpetuity, you know, until something else changes. Now, it goes without saying that something can't be in perpetuity until something else changes. That's a contradiction. And because of this, just one sentence added to this would make this very clear. Uh, I, I suggested a sentence of, this policy specifically does not allow a section of class one trail in the L Street corridor to be relocated or removed from that L Street corridor unless it is to be replaced with a separate bicycle and pedestrian pathways within the same corridor to make it or, or similar language. It's unlikely that that trail is going to be removed, which is fine. So let's put it in writing. Um, Commissioner Mayor also pointed out that it's not clear under what circumstances a trail will be rerouted. The intent of the policy, I think we all agree, is a good intention. But how is it enforced? Who decides if a trail should be rerouted? Who decides if it's an improvement? Is it the zoning administrator? Is it the Transportation Safety Committee? In theory, it could be done without the Planning Commission knowing about it, which is not a good idea from my point of view. Um, it could be done without any awareness of the Transportation Safety Committee or, or the Commission. Um, that's what I want to say. I think one sentence, or minimum of one sentence, added to this policy would make, it, make a lot of people in Arcata feel much more secure, given the statement in perpetuity unless something else changes. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Any other members of the public wish to speak on this item? Do we have- Go ahead, Jim. Um, hello, David and the staff. Um, I will speak briefly. I know Fred spoke on this in depth um, and I do appreciate it, but I will just reinforce that I believe that the L Street Rails with Trails Corridor should be decoupled from the policy CME, CM, uh, now I forgot the policy, um, CM uh, 5C or 5E7, uh, and uh, just to decouple it, I'm actually right now at the um, town hall meeting, but thought I would take a minute to reinforce what's been kind of my opinion all along that you shouldn't really allow for this opportunity in any way for that trail to be moved by developer and by the zoning administrator. And I realize this might 
not be landing well, but at least I feel like last week the question was asked, is it possible for this to happen? Can the trail be moved just simply by somebody that's a developer requesting and claiming it's going to be improvement in connectivity? And the answer is yes, and I hope you would consider that. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Any others? Okay, we will close public comment on this item. And um, now we jump back into our uh, framework, version 4.2. And the first step on that would be to um, move on down to in, under meeting method number five. Um, proposals are shown on the screen. And uh, Judith, one item at a time, uh, you have give us your elevator pitch, your 45 second elevator pitch to see. Okay, we're gonna we take go. a last whack at this and um, see if anything takes. Um, we are on the LU1N Samoa Boulevard, is that correct? Um, so we've heard that the draft um, of the plan would like industrial uses shall be encouraged to relocate and expand within the adaptation zone boundary of this area as described in the city's local coastal program. Now, saying that industrial uses will continue, will be allowed, um, will be permitted, um, is is something that will prevent the premature abandonment of this area. Um, saying that they will be encouraged presumably means there's some kind of city subsidy um, or some policy encouragement to make that meaningful. Um, and what that does is it puts more uses, more people, more property, and more investment in harm's way. Now, the local coastal program, the draft as, as we've seen it so far, specifies that anyone expanding or building in that area um, that may be subject to hazards um, has to be aware of that fact and that in the riskier areas, they have to be ready to disinvest. Um, but that's the policy today before stuff is physically being built there. Um, the, the, the city clearly wants the revenue of additional development for the time that it can stay there. But there really are no guarantees that people who invest in that area will still be around to disinvest or to protect their property um, at the date in the future when it becomes risky. Unless they put down a bond that's wishful thinking. And what it does is it creates a constituency that will demand city continued encouragement, approval, and tolerance of unsustainable development um, in an area at risk. And I've proposed some alternative language, um, and I, I'm going to modify that here. Um, Samoa Boulevard and South G Street Employment and Industries. The city shall support industrial land uses south of Samoa Boulevard to the extent that they're not threatened by sea level rise or seismic hazards and that they do not increase vulnerability of people, property, or ecosystem to those hazards. Um, the local coastal program does address this. There are a lot of things that the local coastal program addresses that are also addressed at kind of a higher policy level, a more general policy level in the general plan. This is one of them. Thank Judith, you, Judith, I have a question. Are you saying you're striking the word only? I'd, I'd be willing, I'd be very willing to strike the word only. It weakens the statement that it might make it more palatable. Yeah, I think that would be good. Other commissioner responses, communications? Well, I, I personally would like to hear staff's because staff had rejected this one in their recommendations. So I'm 
curious to hear their side. Yeah, I'll try and be um, very brief on this. The reason we're suggesting that you reject it, as we stated, is that it is dealt with in finer detail in other parts of the code and other uh, policy documents. And um, uh, that's, that's one, I think, really good ground for not having something that's uh, overly detailed in another section that could be in conflict with the uh, local coastal program. Uh, but I think the, the bigger issue here is that this uh, stems from a lot of public engagement direction that we received from the councils prior uh, to head down this, this course of trying to encourage uses to clean up the uh, South G Street area, where right now you have sort of legacies of heavy industrial uses. Many of those properties are basically used as uh, junkyards um, currently. And uh, so this is part of an overall strategy in combination with other things that are in the local coastal program, like the commercial visitor serving coastal commercial visitor serving overlay uh, that's being proposed for that area to try and uh, encourage people to tra transition their uses away from existing uses, cleaning up those sites in the meantime, uh, both the visual elements that they have, but also the, the legacy contamination that's on those sites. And so, um, yeah, I feel like this is, uh, you know, not just a staff recommendation, but it's been supported by the council for a number of years to, to continue that, uh, this policy as it's currently stated. So David, are you saying this isn't necessary? I think it, I think that Commissioner Mayer's proposal runs counter to the direction that we received from prior councils the policy discussions that we've had to this date. Uh, which doesn't mean we can't recommend it. They can reject it. They can adapt. Or... Any other comments? Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm just responding. I think the a role of the Planning Commission is to advise the City Council on issues related to planning. This could be some strong advice. The Council may have encouraged um, encouraging um, new development in that area um, and we can advise the council that perhaps they should reconsider that and get that language into the general plan um, and into the local coastal program as well. Thank you. Joel, do you have any thoughts on this? I have a question of staff or, or since um, I don't have a photographic memory of everything in the general plan update, are there any other um, areas of the city where there's a suggestion that light and in general industrial uses uh, be encouraged? Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the um other industrial areas of the city, we would also encourage them. So uh, West End Road is one of the areas that is gonna remain in light industrial. A lot of light industrials uh, in the gateway area is being converted to uh, commercial mixed use uh, with the gateway overlays. Um, and so, um, you know, we'd be transitioning away from those areas and encouraging to redirect into uh, the zones that we have uh, retained as industrial. Peter, do you have anything else to contribute? Uh, no, thanks, Tim. Um, well, uh, I, I'm thinking of the Matthew Dams. Well, I, actually, I do. I, I, I agree with what David said. I mean, that, that whole area of South G Street is, is pretty junky right now, and it, it could be a, a lot healthier than it is. And the fact is that the contamination that's there now will only leach into the bay eventually. So the sooner we clean it up, the better. Yeah, thank you. So I guess I want, I want to clarify that. So the idea here is we're encouraging development in part because that development will have to remediate those legacy sites and then that will make 
future sea level rise planning a little bit easier because those sites have been remediated. Is that the, the concept? Correct. And there also is an overlay about um, transitioning away from industrial more towards what was it? Uh, ocean uses? Something yeah, commercial like visitor serving. Coastal commercial visitor serving yeah. is um, yeah special overlay in the coastal zone. Joel, were you going to say something? No. Judith? Yeah, um, this doesn't say anything, this language about coastal visitor, visitor serving uses, which I also think that the Coastal, coastal Commission might um, feel positively about. But frankly, given the wealth of alternative industrial sites in Arcata for non-coastal dependent uses, why would anyone go into an area where they would need to clean up somebody else's mess if there was not something uniquely desirable for an industry in that location, knowing that they might have to abandon that location and pay for the cost of moving at some time in the reasonably near future. Um, and that if they tried to sell those sites, the potential purchasers would know that they're that much closer to losing their longer term investment. Um, <clears throat> a city staffer once told me that um, a 15 year investment can be amortized um, by development in that site. And that's okay for a lot of owners. It may be okay for a lot of commercial or industrial owners with pop-up buildings or whatever. It is not sustainable from an environmental or public safety perspective. And that policy, um, if the city council continues to pursue it, um, is not a sustainable policy and it's not something that the city of Arcata should endorse. So I've proposed some alternative language which allows continued industrial use in that area, but does not go so far as positively, actively encouraging additional use, which is not necessarily likely to clean up the area. It sounds to me, Judith, from your language that you uh, don't mind supporting the industrial land use um, only but to the extent that they are not threatened by sea level, you know, it's you just want to point it out that you're in a risk area. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the, the, the policy of encouraging additional industrial development in that area, um, if what you want to do is to clean up the area, say that. Say that what you want is redevelopment of that area. Um, don't necessarily say that you're you're wanting industrial relocation to that area and additional development if if that's not actually the reason that you're encouraging presumably new construction there um, in areas subject to coastal hazards which this area will become, even if it's not now, encouraging new development is probably not a wise thing to do. Supporting existing development provides the revenue and the activity that the city seems to want. So I'm just asking to sort of scale it down a little bit. Okay, I think we better do a straw poll on this unless there's any last comments. Before we do, uh, can I hear Judith's I, proposed language? Yeah, I, I have one last comment to Dan. I, I just want to add a little um, uh, time scale reality here. Um, you know, if you look at the OPC draft of sea level rise, this area of South G Street is definitely in the coastal zone and definitely going to be threatened by sea level rise. But even the year 2100, this area is not going to be underwater, not even close. So, you know, yes, 
that's an issue going into the future, but it's pretty far into the future. It's not next decade. It's not the next two decades. It's multiple decades away. So a lot can happen in that time. Just wanted to set that time scale. Thank you, Peter. Any and other? Commissioner Yodowitz, the language is on packet page 39 uh, under the first bullet point about uh, three quarters down. It reads, Samoa Boulevard and South G Street, employment industries, the city shall support industrial land uses south of Samoa Boulevard, striking the word only to the extent that there are, they are not threatened by sea level rise or seismic hazards and that they do not increase the vulnerability of people, property, or ecosystems to those hazards. Okay, straw poll. Commissioner Lehman, you're going to just have to tell us how you're straw polling here. <laughs> All right. are, are we doing the number system? Or are we? <laughs> what are we doing? <laughs> Is it a yes or no? Uh, degrees of agreement uh, is that what it was called uh, no you, you can just start out by um, seeing if there's support for the measure yeah so all in in favor go ahead and raise your hand and peter say yes if you're in favor of making the change that commissioner mayor has proposed and then uh, if not a quorum then move on peter where are you at I guess I'm not going to, I guess not. And is that it? Okay. I, I'm, I'm undecided, I got to say, <laughs> but I, I'll vote no. Okay. All right. That Can I ask a clarifying question? Just one more. Any new development would require a coastal development permit from the, right? Like, this any, gonna yes, be... any new development would require either a coastal development permit from the city or if it's in the retained jurisdiction from the state. I, I, I don't think we need to adopt the different language. Sure. Um, oh, shoot. Sorry. The suggested language is the city shall develop. Um, this is with regard to form based design standards. The city shall develop form based design standards that are appropriate for each infill opportunity zone. Um, the language in the draft general plan um, is, 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 something that I think became confusing when some of the policies from the gap moved into the general plan. And there's been a great deal of confusion about how form-based codes may be adopted um, in other areas of the city beyond the gateway area um, plan area. Um, there have been proposals to use form-based codes in other areas of the city, it's not clear what would trigger them. Um, in one part of the um, LU1Y language, it appears that um, it would be increased density that would trigger form-based standards. It's not clear whether there would be a single set of form-based standards across the city. So this language simply indicates that if form-based design standards are to be used, um, that each infill opportunity zone would be subject to its own set of standards, recognizing the unique characteristics of those locations above and beyond any standards that are adopted citywide, which are not negated in any way um, by area-specific form-based code standards, which may be adopted in the future. Um, I think staff might believe that since there are 
no other areas that would be subject to form-based codes right now. Perhaps it doesn't belong in the general plan language. Um, but one thing that the general plan does do is to provide direction for future zoning changes through policy. And that's what this language does. It makes it very clear um, how form-based codes above and beyond those that would apply citywide as design standards would work in new areas to which they would be subject. Okay, thank you. Uh, commission I, questions? I, yeah. yeah, I have a question. And that is the, the development of the form-based code for the gateway area was a long involved process. And as Fred has pointed out, is not done, I'm sure. Um, and costs a lot of money. And are, are we going to start from scratch at each different zone in the city? That seems nuts. Uh, or do we have some sort of, you know, how's this going to work? Is there going to be kind of a base uh, form-based code and then there are little addenda for each different zone to, to address the idiosyncrasies of each zone uh, or, or how? How is this going to work? Because starting from scratch and doing it all over for every zone is just, it's not going to work. It's too onerous. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yeah, if I can there? respond to that, um, I don't think there's um, necessarily any reason to start from scratch in particular areas. Um, however, it would require a review of any proposed design standard for that area above and beyond the design standards for the city as a whole um, for any new area where a form-based code design standard for that area is going to be adopted. So no, you would not be starting from scratch in each area, but you would be providing standards appropriate to that area rather than adopting a blanket form-based code that would be applied to multiple areas. Um, I think staff believes that, that, that that's clear in the plan. The statement further clarifies that. Um, and obviously, since there's only one area where these form-based code standards um, have been proposed so far, future planning commissions would then um, be able to use this policy um, to figure out the extent to which any existing form-based code f for an area where it's already been adopted might be applied to another area. Um, it's possible that a future planning commission would say, hey, well, these two areas are pretty similar. Let's just take that set of codes and adopt them here with these exceptions. And what this language does is it insists that the application of um, design standards above and beyond those that apply citywide to relevant zones um, would come before the public and could be reviewed and discussed and adopted. Okay, thank you. Um, do any commissioners object to this language moving forward? Um, or would you like to hear I, from Can staff? I ask another yeah, question? Yeah, you bet. Um, David, is, is there a plan to have sort of a base, uh, form-based code? for the city that will then be, um, you know, uh, adapted for each different zone? Because right now we have a form-based code for gateway. But, you know, what, I, I'm trying to see how this is actually gonna work. Um, th there's no sort of basic form-based code for the city of Arcata 
which is then tweaked for each zone, right? Is there a plan to do it that way? Um, not at the time. That hasn't been discussed. Um, we have the one form based code in uh, the gateway area and any additional areas where um, new ordinances are adopted has to go through an entirely separate public process. And so part of that public process may be, as Commissioner Mayor laid out, that we uh, really start from, you know, a template with the gateway code and build on or subtract from that. Uh, but we haven't really had that. We have not had that conversation yet. Um, Commissioner Lehman. So I, I think that it's a good conversation to have as we come into our next form based code, but each of them would have to be an, uh, independently adopted, which is part of the reason why staff is neutral on it. I think if the, uh, you know, if it's confusing to the public to not have um, that modifier in there, then, you know, it's, it's a good change. Uh, Mr. Simmons. Yeah. Judith. Yeah, I, um, Peter, I just wanted to point out that we, we do have a set of design standards linked to our zoning code that applies citywide and that is different in each relative, relevant zone. Um, in fact, that is a form-based code. Um, our, our design standards are a citywide design code. When we say form-based code, we're, we're really just distinguishing standards that um, for shorthand apply to the outward facing aspects of um, a design code. So we, we do have a base code and our location specific form-based code goes beyond that for particular places. Um, and making clear that going beyond the city design standards for additional places needs to be reviewed on an area by area basis is all this statement is doing. And it could be that a future planning commission could just adopt uh, the gateway code to another district. They, they would have that option. Aren't we clarifying that they wouldn't have that option? No. Okay, so maybe I read clarify that each infill zone will have a separate code differently than you do. But I thought we were. <laughs> I, I feel like, you know, this is semantics. Um, you know, each code adoption is going to go through a process that will require a planning commission recommendation and a city council adoption. The language as it's currently stated has no bearing on that. I, f I feel like we've spent a lot of time discussing semantics and if it makes folks to feel good to add the word only or um, whatever, each, excuse me, we should do it. It's not gonna change the way the process works. Um, if a future planning commission chooses to take the gateway code and change that to the St. Louis road code and not do anything else, they can do that. It will not prevent them from doing that. In sure. fact, they could probably even say gateway code two, and then we'd have a whole new gateway area to, to think about. But uh, yeah, no, I, think, I think you guys should make the change. There's been enough people who have said, we want to see the word each to make sure that each yeah. has its own process. Joe? Yeah, or as, you know, maybe as an alternative, we can just strike LU1Y if we're going to need, you know, I mean, which I think the problem maybe arose, I don't want to put words in Judith's mouth, at least in my mind, uh, that that policy talks about using form-based code uh, where there's high density housing and not a more general you know, opportunity zone or uh, other, even uh, other uses. So that's where the confusion is in my mind. So I can go either way on this. Okay, straw poll on moving Judith's language forward. Peter? Yes. Okay, motion carries. And can I just get a confirmation on the last, uh, the last vote? I don't think I got it right, but then Jen corrected me. It's 3-2. Did we have two people vote? Yes. Yes, okay. correct. Okay. All right, LU-2. 
Elevator pitch time. Um, this was a suggested change that didn't necessarily assume that we were going to be getting rid of planned developments. Um, and right now, the planned development um, policies across the city apply only to medium density residential development. Um, I think they could apply elsewhere. Um, I think that revising planned development overlays is probably sufficient when we talk about removing planned development overlays. Um, we're going a bit deeper into the historic um, planning and zoning process that has given the city some discretion in reviewing unusual types of development proposals, things that don't necessarily fit into um, the standard models that a more limited zoning code would provide for us. Um, simply getting rid of the removing planned development overlays wouldn't change the fact that in the future, a planning commission and city council might decide to remove some planning planned development overlays. They could still do that. But by making a policy that indicates that, yeah, we want to go remove those planned development overlays in the general plan, um, you're, you're, you're kind of creating an assumption that the PD overlay is not a good thing. And I, I think that it is a very important policy tool for the city to maintain and reinforce rather than to undermine. Thank you. Can staff inform us as to when the last uh, planned development occurred and why the city says there's several reasons to eliminate them? Um, the last planned development that occurred, I think the last one that was built out was probably the Q Street subdivision um, off Q near 11th Street. Uh, but currently, um, many properties that are vacant have uh, planned development overlays on them or a requirement for planned development overlays. Um, and really this and the, um, the implementation that suggests considering, you know, PDs, re revising PDs, um, is intended to allow the commission after we've gone through this process to have a much more in-depth conversation about this. PDs are very uh, complicated um, and I think there are several uh, types of PDs that need to be eliminated. Um, the best example I can give is the Type A PD. Type A plan development permit is required for properties that don't ask for any exceptions to the code whatsoever. No use restriction changes, no standard restriction changes. It just makes absolutely no sense. You have to go spend thousands of dollars to get a PD overlay on your property to do exactly what the code tells you we want you to do in the first place. So I agree with Commissioner Mayer that the PD is a powerful tool for planning unique sites or sites that have constraints. And we do want to um, you know, retain the PD in the toolbox, but there are several PD types and um, you know, many of the PD processes that we've been implementing for the last 20 years that I do not believe work for our community. And I think many of the people who have the PDs would, would agree. So um, I think you should reject the change for that reason. But um, I also agree that if we have a policy that just says review and evaluate PDs, it would be a less strong statement indicating that you'd be considering reject, uh, removing some PD types. Uh, but you could still do that at that time. So I say reject, but it's not a strong reject. Okay, commission. Questions, responses?
th this is one of those ones that's about a future thing. And I, and I totally understand that the general plan is us telling ourselves in the future what we want to do. Um, but I think it's okay to have consider eliminating PDs in the general plan, particularly for uh, sort of antiquated ones like the one Director Loya talked about. And then in the future, the Future Planning Commission can decide with more information which ones to keep or which ones to jettison. Can I, can I ask another question? Um, part, of, part of this item and my comment, the original thing that motivated it was looking at the table and noticing something I'd noticed years ago, um, that it appears that plan developments are limited only to medium density residential development. Um, this is what the table indicated. And I don't think that they should be limited only to medium density residential development. In, in fact, they should be the types of things that would open up a site to a way more creative possible mix of uses. And so my original comment here was on that table, um, and it came out of a much longer set of comments um, and got kind of collapsed into this. It's on page 215, David. Right. Thank you. Page 215 of the um, draft and page 39 of the packet. If you can read the, if you can read the teeny tiny type. In the left top box, you have planned developments, and then an X next to RM, but no other. I, I could imagine an RH planned development, right? Or yeah, they're currently uh, required in any residential um, zoning district that has uh, half an acre or more that is vacant. Right. So my original comment really was saying, let, let's not limit um, what you can do on a planned development to medium density residential use, in fact that should be a means of really opening up the possibility of, of a wider variety of uses even beyond residential. So how can we move forward in a way that it sounds like there's general agreement that uh, there's perhaps in the future a place for planned development. The way they're written right now is problematic and the way they've been utilized in recent history has been very problematic. And as we see from the table, that it's been far too limiting. Well, so for, first I would change the table in the draft. Um, and then I, then I would say consider revising planned development overlays, which would cover the, the um, situation that David mentioned with regard to particular types that might not make sense. So your LU-2 would, instead of saying con don't consider eliminating, you would just now suggest consider revising and scrutinizing or something, revising the use of planned developments? Yeah, that, that, that would work. And then change the table. Staff response, anything to say to that? Um, I mean, the, yeah, we could, you know, I, I think it's reasonable to change the table to allow planned developments um, in other residential districts. Um, I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm not going to reiterate it um, in terms of the rationale for leaving the language as it is, but it's, it's up to you. Um, how about if we just say consider revising or eliminating planned development overlays? We're not... That was the original language. <laughs> well, right. it seems to cover all bases. OK, I, I don't feel as strongly about this one as I do about some of the others. Um, and, and, you know, if, if we can change that table, um, 
that would make me happy. I think there's agreement with everyone to change the table. So let's, we can stop pull on that. Yeah, and that falls under revising anyway. Yes. Right? So then that means we leave the language as is. Do we have straw poll support for that? Yes. Yes, okay, moving along. Thank you, everybody. Okay, I feel a lot stronger about the next one. Um, LU-6. We're on LU-6 and the proposed language came out of a process years ago um, that allowed the Cypress Grove um, cheese factory to be built on a very large ag exclusive prime soil site in town um, with no agricultural production from within Arcata with no other farming or grazing on that prime agricultural site. Um, and the way the language that came out in the draft addressed it, um, it only applied to a situation where all of those things that we don't want to see industrializing our ag exclusive sites would have to occur rather than where any one or combination of them would occur. Um, and so changing those um, ands to ors would really allow us to retain our ag exclusive land in kind of agricultural stuff rather than allowing it to be developed um, with industrial uses that are inappropriate to those locations. Um, any one or combination of those um, characteristics would be things that the general pl flag, the general plan would flag, and that could then be implemented through um, language in the zoning code. So it would direct us what to do with our zoning code. Um, okay, thank you. I have a question of staff because I thoroughly remember that debate uh, it was heated and there was the right to farm stuff that was brought up um, and I thought some kind of state precedent about uh, letting farmers do what farmers do something like that and that ag buildings fit within ag use and that it might have been hard to control that and I'm wondering if we're we are starting to edge into that territory on this new language or not yeah, I, I just changed uh, the staff recommendation from neutral to support. I mean, I, I I was here, but peripheral to that whole conversation, and I hope I'm not hurting anyone's feelings by saying it's ludicrous to have made that kind of determination that all of those categories would have to apply. I think a, you know, this language was not changed from the original general plan 2020. There was no change to this language um, proposed, and so, you know, I do think adding ors as the clauses uh, um, clarifies that you can meet, meet any one of those. I'd need to kind of think about it, I think, a little bit more detail about whether there might be some of those that are sort of weaker uh, and would need to be combined. But I think, you know, generally clarifying that language makes sense to me. And I would hope that no community development director in the future would read those ands as you would have to stack all of those uses on top to be able to reject and ag use in, or an industrial ag use in, in ag zoning. Okay, straw poll then. I think. Okay. Yes. And are, Joel, are you comfortable as well with uh, me kind of fine tuning if there are some of those? And I'll I'll bring the language back to you. But uh, if there sure. are some of those that are that are weaker that need to be combined. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Just a, a another comment on that one. Um, th this is policy language in the general plan. Obviously, the applied language would be in the, in the zoning code, and that could provide for opportunities to, you know, review specific uses if they come into that borderline area. Um, but the policy direction would be clear in a way that it wasn't 
in the 2020 language and that allowed development that I considered to be um, inappropriate for that site to squeak in because the language said it could. Okay, good catch, good one. Uh, LU-9. Oh, and we had a unanimous draw poll on that one, Jennifer, if you're tracking. Okay, this this is a trick, trickier one. Um, the language I had suggested is rezoning of or in a neighborhood conservation zone must include location-specific design standards, and then somehow some stuff got stuck in there that was supposed to have been crossed out that recognize and protect key aspects of the neighborhood's unique and historic character. Um, there, there have been proposals to reconsider um, particularly the residential density in um, neighborhood conservation areas like Bayview and Sunset. Um, to provide greater housing densities near um, downtown and the and the university, um, and I think the language that I suggested indicates that yeah, if you're going to consider rezoning those areas, you don't want to completely ignore the um, reasons for which they were designated as na neighborhood conservation zones in the first place, which include their unique and historic character. It's, it would still allow um, for carefully considered density changes in those areas um, without completely steamrolling over um, historic resources and strong neighborhood character. And, and Matt, I know you have problems with that that term neighborhood character, which is why I didn't use it. Um, but it seems like this is language that would um, allow change and balance it with some continuity that um, the city would at least need to consider above and beyond what it considers in areas that have not been designated by um, past councils and planning commissions and recognized by staff um, for their value as neighborhood conservation zones. Okay. Commission? Thoughts? I'd like to hear from staff on this proposal. Um, the reason we're proposing that you do not make this change uh, primarily focuses on inserting the requirement for location-specific design standards. Um, I think it's perfectly appropriate to ensure that you know any kind of rezone takes into consideration impact on historic uh, structures, historic landmarks, and um, you know the historic character, uh, if you want to use those terms, um, but to essentially say that no rezoning can happen until you come up with site-specific design standards that, that specifically address this point, um, I think probably goes a little too far into specifying what that process is gonna look like before you even decide to take that process on. So that's why we'd recommend to reject it. If you took out the site-specific design standards, I think um, we could support, you know, uh, support the idea of uh, considering historic resources. Can I respond? Oh, please. I, th I think that that language um, appears there to guide any changes in our zoning code. Um, it could be that the design standards for that area would be extremely minimal. They would address one particular aspect of the area um, and it would provide a clear means to um, implement a respectful zoning change. Um, so 
it's not saying that there's got to be a whole form based code separately adopted for these areas but that the idea that it is through design standards that we demonstrate respect for an area's unique characteristics remains a policy. Okay, Commission, anything? So I, it sounds like you're particularly concerned about the historic districts that are already sort of designated as historic districts. And I'm, I guess I'm curious how that already existing designation doesn't that sort of cover some of the concern and that any future consideration of a rezone would also have to grapple with those already sort of on the books historic districts? It could be possible for someone to propose to basically eliminate the historic districts. Um, and I could em envision some future council and some future planning condition doing that. This puts an additional review process before the public um, in there and demands res respect of the policy processes that designated those areas as unique and deserving of um, notice of their uniqueness to begin with. I, 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 I somehow I, I imagine that uh, the commissioners who own historic properties might um, have more insight into this one. Yeah, my, my, my concern is overly, you know, tying, uh, having an overly restrictive policy given our need for housing and need for increased density. Um, and yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's what troubles me about the proposal. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm all for flexibility, but I still, you know, recognize the historic districts for sure, um, but not being overly restrictive. So, I mean, I, if there's any way we can soften this language that would appease, uh, you know, or that, that, that you could live with, I'd uh, probably be in favor of it. Oops, I, I don't think it's really necessary. I, I'm i not fearful that some future planning commission or city council is going to ruin a historic neighborhood. And I think any, you know, I, it, it, this is going to have to come before the planning commission if any changes are going to happen. And I agree with what Joel just said. I mean, with the need for housing, we don't want to be restrictive. I, I'm not that worried. I mean, I live in a historic neighborhood, but I, I'm not that worried. Well, as David suggested, if we were to eliminate the wording that says include location specific design standards, um, it uh, the the language would then provide a means for increasing density um, without necessarily being overly restrictive. Would that be more acceptable? Well, I mean, why is it necessary at all? Because it would provide a policy to guide future zoning changes. This is the policy levels document. The zoning code is the implementation means and the policy document would then provide clear guidance for implementation. How does staff feel about softer language? Uh, it's, it's really up to you. I mean, I think if you changed it to uh, and rezoning for uh, rezoning of or in a neighborhood conservation zone uh, must consider the neighborhood's unique and historic character. I think there's already policy that, you know, that basically says that, and so this would reinforce that policy. Um, but it's, yeah, uh, as, as currently written, uh, we would continue to uh, not support it. But as revised, it'd be fine. 
Okay, Commission, you want a straw poll on a revised language? Um, I guess no. Peter, are you weighing in? I, I'm saying no. Okay. My I'd own. like to keep the current language. Joe? I'm confused. Keep the, the current, current language, language of Judas. No, the, oh. the current language of LU9. Yeah. I, I, so I you, would support um, uh, modifying it to say rezoning. I'm going to change David's language a little bit. Just going with Judith's proposal, rezoning of other in a neighborhood conservation zone, since you're going to be, um, that rec should, should recognize and protect uh, the neighborhood's unique and historic character. As a process piece, do you want to finish the straw poll? I know it's not formal, but the straw poll that was on the table to begin with? Well, I'm fine with it, yes. Let's go ahead. So you're saying that a no, I think, because I, I you'd like... No to the language as proposed. Okay, there was a no. There's Judith was a yes, I assume. Okay, I'm, your I'm, language. I'm willing to go with um, rezoning of or in a neighborhood conservation zone must recognize and protect key aspects of the neighborhood's unique and historic character, which, you know, the, the historic preservation parts of the general plan already say that, but they say nothing about rezoning. Okay, they address that, individual structures. Was that your original language or were you just rephrasing jo Joel's language? Because we're trying to finish that straw poll. Um, that, that was the proposal that David made and that I think. Okay, so then on the original straw poll, we have uh, two no's and uh, well, you were a, Go ahead. Uh, just to be uh, clear, I, I did not want the word key aspects in there. I wanted it more general. Okay, I'm going to vote no on it too. So let's now, so the straw poll fails. And if we want to do another rewrite to see if the next straw poll flies, let's try that, Joel. And Matt, you have a question. I have a comment, I guess, and I'm curious how it lands with the other commissioners, which is that part of what makes a building historic is having newer buildings next to it. And so this, you know, taking an entire neighborhood and saying it's historic and you've got to keep it with that look for forever, it, it doesn't actually accomplish the goal of historic preservation in my belief. But I, Yeah, the, the language, the revised language that I'm proposing allows for that. There's no problem with that. Um, it, 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 our, there's, there's nowhere in our historic um, preservation or design standards that addresses the issues of rezoning an area rather than of um, impacts to individual structures. And this would address that. Now, nobody's proposed to rezone any of these areas yet, but this would provide policy guidance for that implementation measure to follow. You know, and the reality at the end of the day is um, there's not a lot of new structures being built in these areas besides ADUs. And um, in my time here, some of the new projects are don't fit in in terms of historic character at all. We just went through this in the, um, you know, A Street developments. Um, you know, there was some nearby residences that look similar to this very modern couple of new houses that got built but uh, in terms of the historic character of the Bayview district it was you know completely out of place so, so there's there is a lot of flexibility in this and I don't think it's going to hinder development actually um, unless I mean there's a lot of other things that are hindering development mostly that there's almost no lots in these districts to build on so um, we need to either reject this completely and move on or change the language one last time and strap pull it. And it seems like we're, we're darn close to just cruising with some language that we can all tolerate. 
Joel, do you want to try? You were on to something that I thought was well, getting well, traction. My proposal is this kind of tracking but eliminating due to some of Judith's language. Rezoning of or in a neighborhood conservation zone uh, must recognize the neighborhood's unique and historic character. Okay, strong poll on that, please. Yes. One yes. Uh, recognize without protect. No protect in there. Just recognize. That's what I voted on. Joel, are you strap polling yes on this? I'll strap poll yes. Okay, Matt. Matt is a no. Judith? I, th I think unless there's some indication of protecting, um, it, it doesn't really make sense to have okay. that item in there. So we have uh, two no's, two yeses, and I'll vote yes to roll this one through with Joel's language. Did you get that? Okay, thank you. So CM-5E. Okay, yeah, because we've heard a lot about this. Um, and what more can I say except to read the language that um, I've proposed that would assume that we want more class one trails and that we're not just talking about um, any one particular trail. Um, it also calls on the plan to indicate that it, it, this would probably need to be in some other um, implementation measure um, to indicate which limited circumstances would allow um, a class one trail to be um, D, I don't know, moved or D, deconstructed or whatever. The important thing there is that it would require as an implementation measure to set up a process for f figuring that out. Um, whereas now, I think as one of our public commenters said, um, it could basically be decided um, on a staff level with the public finding out about it when the bulldozers moved in. Okay, commission? I, I always find it helpful to hear staff's thoughts on neutral slash reject, which is a little unclear. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the idea that you're going to suddenly wake up one morning and the roads are different because a decision was made that the public had no idea about um, just isn't within the realm of possibility. When public roads, uh, trails, assets are modified, um, there's a huge public process that goes along with it. It goes on to a capital improvement program. The Planning Commission reviews its consistency with the general plan. It goes before the, pl the City Council as a, a you know, funding item through the budget process. It gets to a point where we've got money for it and we want to hire a consultant to do that. It gets into a uh, public engagement process. The Commission decides to tell you to do more public engagement different than what you thought you were going to do in the first place. <laughs> And then you move on and you finally get an award for, for the contract. Um, it's just, it's nonsensical that it's going to happen that way. Um, the point here, I, I feel like we're making much about nothing. And the reason why I'm somewhat neutral on it is because there's been so much made about nothing at this point. It's like, you know, if you all want to modify the policy, let's modify it. The, the policy is written such that if there is something that needs to happen because of something that we can't foresee now that's going to modify an existing trail, that you do not lose the connectivity of that trail. As I said last time, there's nothing on the books right now. As far as I know, all of the trails will remain in perpetuity the way that they are. 
I don't know what's going to come down the road. I can't tell you that now. But that's the vision, is that they will remain in perpetuity. And if something comes down the road and a future council, a future planning commission decides, hey, look, this project that's coming in, it's really, uh, we really want to have that project. Or because of the way this project's coming in, we want to put uh, you know, a public park, a little parklet right where the trail is located. We're going to have to re, uh, you know, remove, move the park the, or the trail around the park. Or who knows what number of circumstances are going to come up. And of course, yes, we're going to have new trails. That's not, this policy doesn't say you can't have new trails unless you destroy one. That's not what it says. Um, so I don't think it's necessary for that reason either. Um, but it's really, it's up to you. It's up to the city council to decide whether or not, you know, these are important enough to specify in this policy. I think it's the way that it's currently written, it addresses the need, and that need is to make sure that there's continued connectivity amongst our ever-increasing and highly robust at the current time uh, trail system that will go through a very public process before any of it is, is modified. I like that language. Can That's we too long that for a policy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, this is a bit of an aside, but I secretly wish that the L Street Linear Trail, which is where this discussion usually comes to, wasn't quite so linear. You know, it, it kind of, I think, would feel a lot better if it had a few curves in it um, and, you know, some wetland mitigation or something here and there throughout it. But, and we've so clarified, no net loss of class one trails. It curves, right? No. Right. It's pretty much a line. Um, anyway, so where do we want to go here? You want to, you guys ready to straw poll or? I've lost the thread. Are we? Um, well, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure what we're voting on. What we're the same as the others that we're either going to move this language forward or not. So. Um, Judith is suggesting a language change. Either we reject the language change and leave it as is. I am happy to emphasize uh, existing trails should be expanded. Yeah, that's what I think. I think we shouldn't just retain the amount that we have. We should emphasize that we need more. Thank you, Peter, Judith. So what my comment here is really asking for is it's asking for somewhere if in, in the general plan or um, it, it's not really a zoning issue and it's not really a design standard issue. Um, if in the general plan we could list the limited circumstances that we can foresee in which the city would allow a developer to move a bike trail or request that it be moved, and how the developer would need to demonstrate the need to do that. Um, that's something that could be an implementation measure, um, but to have that simple language in the plan um, indicating that there would be a clear process for a developer to propose moving much loved public infrastructure and for them to have to demonstrate the need for it, um, that would provide a road to some objective standards that the commission and staff and presumably um, the council could use to say, is this something we should consider or is it um, something that probably doesn't meet that level of need. Question for clarity. What if, uh, you said a developer to move a trail. What if it was the Parks and Rec or somebody? The city can also be a developer. Okay. Um, the applicant. Maybe change it to, um, I, I didn't, I didn't want to limit the city because we know that the city has rigorous public processes, et cetera. But yeah, ideally, you know, sometimes the city is a developer and, and we could add the city or a developer. Okay. It, it would simply provide some kind of a roadmap that the public would understand. Thank you, Joe. Well, yeah, for uh, my part, I'm far less worried that a developer is gonna move a 
bike trail. I, I kind of agree with David that that would take a long, long process and lots of people would have something to say about it. I would, I you know, I recommended the meeting before last that we put in words to strengthen our need for class four bike lanes. And uh, I, I'm much more eager to do that than I am to worry about a developer moving a bike lane. I don't think that's a big issue. But I think having more, as a person who rides a bike a lot, um, there is a huge difference between a class four bike lane and a class two bike lane. And I think we need more class four bike lanes. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, I, I can't support Judith's proposal. I think it's, uh, there's just too many potential variables and unknowns. Um, and potential minutia that I'm not sure this is appropriate for a policy and a general plan. So I would I would not support her proposal. Matt, I don't recall your vote. Well, it's sort of a multi-part proposal in Judith's language. I I think we all supported increasing the number of trails, right? And then I think it sounds like Joel is not supportive of like. Uh, standards on when to move a bike trail because that should be a kind of case-by-case -case sort of analysis. Um, I think I agree. And then there was a third one in here too, right? Um, uh, yeah, it was the designation of the L Street um, trail. Right, which I feel like we've covered. Okay. Ultimately, are you a yes or no on this? We're struck. I'm, I'm a half yes and a half no. I'm a, I'm a yes on expand trails and I'm a no on standards for when okay. you move a trail. Um, if you have to go yes or no, you, you, come on. Um, <laughs> we're could, all, I mean, could, there's a lot of places we, in here that support trails. Can we separate trails, them so. out? Can we separate them out? Because there were actually several different policies that were rolled into one here. So you want to rewrite or rephrase? How about you finish the straw poll on the first one? So the yeah, okay. motion on the table is to adopt the language that Commissioner Mayer has proposed. We had... I'm a no. Okay, so we, and I'm a no. So we have uh, four no's. And uh, yeah, Peter was a no on that one. Um, so if you want to try a real quick rewrite, uh, we're getting towards the end. Um, okay, so... Um, that that first one on the recognizing that um, we don't want to reduce the linear feed of trails, no net loss in, in effect, um, eliminate the retain the current total linear. Obviously, we want more trails, so we've got a moving no net loss into the future, right? So can we separate that out? All in favor? Sounds great. Okay, so we agree on that. Um, uh, wait, Peter? I, I, I'm i sorry, I don't understand what I'm asking, being asked. Well, he, you I actually proposed more? some of this yourself in yeah, your February I mean, 15 I, comments. Yeah, but I'm still confused. So do I support more class one trails? Yes. I think we're changing language that currently says do not reduce the number of class one trails to like encourage there to be more of class one trails. Yes, encourage the expansion of class one trails within this city. I like that. that. And no net loss, right, Peter? Yeah. yeah. And no net loss. That's right. All right. Are we complete? Well, I, let's let, if Judith wants to make proposals on like the two other separate parts. Okay. It, it, it does sound as though nobody really wants to ask the city to specify the limited circumstances in which trails could be moved and I'm assuming that right that one pretty much failed yeah we have faith that 
our existing processes are going to do that. So all of you are going to have to be on your toes um, on that one. Um, and then the final one was about the designation of the L Street Linear Park and, and the Arcata Rail and Trail Corridor and the Great Redwood Trail. Um, it's just recognizing that as an asset and naming it. Is that staff, true? Staff response to naming it? Um, I mean, I think you can make a recommendation for a name, but people get pretty sensitive about names. So uh, I, I'm, I mean, I, th I think it's already acknowledged as part of the Great Redwood Trail. Um, it's designated as such. Right, but it should. The, but that designation should be included in our general plan and not just in the subsidiary plans. Can we drop the word linear then? I, I don't know. I, what I'll say is like. Uh, I guess what I'll say is this: is that if if you want it to be named in this policy, um, I would defer. I'd have to defer to Environmental Services because there's probably already a name for it, or there's probably a naming process they'll want to go through, or something like that. So that sounds fine. Okay. Okay, so are we rolling along? Well, it's a little bit of a pun, I guess. Um, Judith, do you feel like you have closure on that one? Can, can I just get uh, confirmation? I think I got nods from all yeah. the folks in the room, but mm -hmm. uh, Peter, are you okay with uh, naming the trail in this policy? Uh, I, yes. Thank is you. it part of the Great Redwood Trail? Is that a fact? We, we, we don't have the exact alignment for that yet. And um, I, I think it's just a policy saying we'd like it to be. Well, then we should say we'd like it to be. I mean, it's, it's part of a lot of different trails. I think it's part of the Coastal Trail. Um, it's uh, you know certainly part of what's been envisioned as the Great Redwood Trail. Um, so... I, the main thing is, as long as you're comfortable with uh, naming it in this policy, then we will work with other folks uh, to make sure it's then named appropriately. Does that work? Yeah, actually, I'm going to vote no. Okay. Do you have that recorded, Jennifer? We good? Yeah. Okay. So now we're moving on to our last policy of the night. Okay, this is going to be my last policy proposal before the Planning Commission, probably, so yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's a very simple change that I think we addressed in, in the past and somehow didn't get into the draft. Um, a language change, ensure that the additional intensity allowed and this refers to um, the value of community benefits in policy D-8C, um, which was moved from the um, gateway into other parts of the general plan. Um, ensure that the additional intensity allowed is appropriately calibrated to the value to the community of the benefits provided. High community value benefits should allow for greater increase in intensity than low community value benefits. And what is changed here is referring not to um, rewarding high costs to the developer, but in rewarding um, high benefits to the community. Our community benefits should not reward a developer spending money on things that we don't necessarily value. So community benefits are related to um, community benefits, not to developer's cost. Good idea. Who would, uh, would what group would decide which are more beneficial and which are less? It would be in our code. This, this is something that has already been put into policy, but that would be implemented through, through um, the d zoning code, which I will not be here to argue about with you. Aren't you glad? 
Yeah, and we, we've spent months and months arguing about this already, so we'll, uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to it. Okay, so do you guys want to hear from staff or they support it? Um, okay, thumbs up. P yes. Peter, you already thumbed up, right? Yeah. All right, that one carries. 5 0. Judy, Judas Less motion is a 5 0. That's good. Um, so that uh, ends our business items, and we move on to correspondence and communications. Do we have any Planning Commission correspondence? Judith, would you like to start? Yeah, I'd actually like to say bye to everyone here. Um, and thank you for letting me serve with you on the Planning Commission all these years, and also to all the previous Planning Commissioners who've um, shared this musical chair game with me. Um, and thank you to staff and obviously to members of the public of uh, city council it's been a real real honor um sometimes it's been fun um and i'm looking forward to trying to figure out what else to do with my tuesday nights so thank you very much to all of you and and it has been an honor to hang out here on the planning commission well thank you judith thank you judith um Joel, would you like to say anything? Anybody else? Yeah, it's been less than a year that I've been sitting next to you, but I certainly um, appreciate uh, the knowledge and your your passion, and uh, probably most of all your persistence <laughs> in in many ways. And uh, thank you for serving on the commission. Um. You were one of the first people that I met when I moved to Arcata. So you, you sort of not only welcomed me to this city, uh, but also to the Planning Commission. And I want to really thank you. You know, you've always come to meetings super prepared and, you know, really thoughtful. Uh, and I really appreciate that about you. Um, I'd like to appreciate your wealth of knowledge that you've brought to this commission and your thorough examination of the material consistently. Um, you regularly were bringing up questions and concerns that I don't think anybody else had thought of. And um, it was always comforting to me to think, as I was reading the material and trying to digest it, that Judith was also reading the material and thoroughly digesting it, and that she'd probably pull out some of the details that I just couldn't quite grasp or the questions that I couldn't formulate. And, and you regularly did. Um, you know, you, you really um, did great work, great homework, thorough and committed to this body. Um, for the 16 years that you've been on the uh, commission, I think that because of your academic background, you've come in as a mentor. And 14 years that I've been in this position, it's been great to have you to go back and forth with, riff with, just like tonight. And no hard feelings, we just move on. We've, um, I feel like we've had a, a very good planning commission for a number of years. And uh, it's just been really nice, the coming and going, but you've been a rock there the whole time. And uh, we've all bounced off of that rock, you know, and it's, um, it's been a healthy process. I, a very healthy dynamic, thoroughly, and I appreciate it. Yeah, Judith, I'll say as a newbie on the commission that you are a role model for how hard you work to do the business that we have to do. And uh, it's uh, you set a high standard for all of us. Thank you. Staff? Yeah, do you mind <laughs> if Please. I say a few words? Um, you know, uh, Judy, you've been on the commission for as long as I've worked for the city of Arcata the second time. Um, you were appointed uh, just after or just before, right around the time when I left. I worked here from 2005 to 2007. And um, so you've worked here my whole second career at the city of Arcata. 
Um, and, you know, it's been, uh, we've had, we, I think you said to me just before the meeting that, uh, you know, we've been great sparring partners, but um, in addition to uh, the banter uh, and the back and forth, which, you know, I know we both, um, you know, probably reveled in at times and at times, you know, maybe uh, been frustrated by each other. Um, you know, I've certainly enjoyed working with you and I appreciate the commitment, uh, the very long and deep commitment that you've made to the community. So thank you. Well, thank you all for your kind words and kind thoughts. And um, I hope you get to enjoy the next stages and all of the challenges that I'm leaving undone. Um, and to members of the public who, who show up and tell us what you think, um, you know, the city is who we're here for. And um, Good luck with all that you undertake and all of the challenges that you know are coming your way. I'm sure you'll be paying attention in the future. You won't be able to help yourself but to watch this process. <laughs> I just fear that we're going to see her out in the audience. <laughs> uh oh. Not really. <laughs> we welcome you in any capacity. <laughs> I just hope we can answer your questions if you're there. Um, if there's nothing else, then David, yep, yeah, one more. Jennifer? Yeah, just a couple correspondence things. Um, there is going to be a goal setting meeting coming up April 2nd for the new budget process. And there's a pre-budget meeting on April 16th. Those are both at 530 here. Um, so just wanted to share that information out. And I think that's about all I have, unless David's got uh, something Are else. we invited to those or not invited? Um, you, you, yeah, the, there's not going to be, it's an open public meeting and there's not going to be items that are on your agenda. So it's, it's fine for you to sit in. They'll also, I believe they're going to be broadcast as well. So you may, you may be able to tune in. I'll find that information out for you and let you know. Great. Um, and then I just wanted to let uh, the commission and the public know uh, that um, local uh, historic resource buff Alex Stillman provided information to me today about a wood window repair workshop that is being hosted by the uh, uh, Eureka Heritage Society. And that workshop will be happening on April 20th. There are only 30 spots, but it's only $10 to take the workshop. Um, and so you should look to their website to get more information about that. Eureka Heritage Society. Eureka Heritage Society, and this is about repairing wood windows to preserve historic resources. Great. Okay, if nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.